All right, so plasma membrane difference. Another difference, cell wall peptoglycan versus no peptoglycan. Um, some archaeas, if they don't have a cell wall, they may have a different structure called a pseudomurin, which is very similar. Is this still from the previous section? Or is this, new? this is still the previous section. DNA replication is another big difference. Um, both have a single replication origin where it starts to replicate and then it circles around or goes in both directions around to replicate their DNA. But their difference is like the initiation, how it starts that process. So with archaea, it's more similar to eukaryotes than it is to prokaryotes. Gene expression, archaea have more than one RNA polymerase. Bacteria only have one RNA polymerase. And that RNA polymerase in archaea is more closely related to eukaryotes than prokaryotes. So they think prokaryotes started first, then uh, archaea branched off from it, and then from archaea, eukarya. Okay, so this is just a summary. Bacteria have a peptoglycan cell wall, archaea don't. Um, the, the hydrocarbons are not branched or um, can never be branched in bacteria, but archaea they can, and that also adds to their extreme environment survivability. RNA polymerase in bacteria, one kind, several kinds. This is what I mean by initiation. The first amino acid in bacteria is F-met, but in archaea it's methionine, just like it is in us, eukaryotes. And then I think your book does talk about introns, but bacteria, it's very rare to have introns. Their genes are in the right sequence. With our, uh, archaea, there's introns, and you have to splice them out. So. so like I said, we have not found all the prokaryotes that are on planet Earth, um, and characterizing them can be kind of difficult. Early classification systems were based on their characteristics. It was like either this or that. So it was either photosynthetic or not photosynthetic. Either, either, either could move or it could not move. Um, it was unicellular or colony forming. It could form spores or it went through binary fission for reproduction. Did it cause disease? Was it a human pathogen or was it not? So they, ha they had these either or classification systems. But now with technology, we have molecular approaches where we look at amino acid sequences, the percentages between guanine and cy uh, cytosine, whether or not it's been hybridized, as well as genome sequencing. Carl Woese um, in the like, late 70s, 60s, late 70s, 80s, uh, came up with a three domain system based on molecular methods, and that molecular method is um, mostly rRNA. So they use rRNA to show evolutionary relationship between the three domains, per, um, bacteria, archaea, eukarya. And then just underneath the prokaryote slash bacteria, um, they, they, there's a big figure in your book that talks about several groupings that have been proposed and that it changes periodically based on new information. So, yeah, we really don't have a great way to, you know, sort prokaryotes. A lot of times we use shape um, to do it. But, yeah. All right, moving on to some review questions. 
In a volcanic vent rich in hydrogen sulfide, you discover a new single-celled non-photosynthetic organism that lacks a nucleus. Based on these characteristics, you initially decide to classify it with the D, archaea, because they live in extreme conditions. A scientist is trying to identify a single-celled organism that has been collected from the deep ocean. It has cell walls contain a peptoglycan, enfolded plasma membranes, one ring, one large ring chromosome, and one type of RNA polymerase. How should this be classified? It is C, yep, a bacterium, because of peptoglycan cell wall. All right, moving on to section two. Prokaryotic cell structure. So I'm going to talk about the three big shapes or main shapes of bacteria. Differences between gram positive and gram negative. So that will be slight review because we've discussed that in the past. past. And then um, just uh, talk about some other features of the prokaryotic cell. So first up is shape. So there's three common shapes in bacteria. Uh, Rod-shaped which they use the scientific term bacillus. The spherical or ovid shaped called the uh, coxy. And then a, a spiral shaped, which they might use the term spirillium or spiral shetty, but it's like helical. So on this picture down here, we have three different bacteria that allow for multiple definitions. Um, like for example, panel C is rod shaped, so that's bacillus. Panels A and C demonstrate strepto because they're linked in chains. So if you've ever heard like of streptococcus, well then you could say, oh, it's a bacteria that is round in shape and it forms chains or Streptobacillus. Oh, it's a rod-shaped bacteria that forms chains. So there's other terms that we use to describe um, bacteria. Here we have coxi in clusters, and so this S stands for staphylo, um, so that was staph infections. So staph means they form clusters, and then we have cocci to show you that or describe the round shape of it. So lots of terms um, to help you figure out what bacteria, like how, what that bacteria might look like. We also have movement. They may have a single or several flagella. As you saw on the previous slide, they may form colonies or cluster together. Some form really weird stock structures or branched filaments. So this comma-shaped one, that's um, vibrillo, and um, that example is uh, cholera. We have spiral shaped or helix like shape. This is a true spirilla. Down here would be a great example of spiral shetty, very delicate, fine twisted structures. Lyme disease, syphilis, spirilla, those are all spiral shetty type bacteria. Um, this one with this weird stalk to it, um, they call it a hypermycomium, if I'm not mistaken. I'm trying to remember my microbiology class. Streptomyces. Uh, this one is kind of a unique structure. This is like a fruit in body. They think it might produce spores, but they're not exactly sure. So kind of a unique structure there. All right, moving on to gram positive and gram negative. So they do have a tough cell wall and some other external features. So gram positive has a thicker peptoglycan wall. When they do a gram test, um, it will stain purple. And gram positive cells contain other substances like liptotoic and toic acid that kind of protrude out from the cell wall. Gram negative, thinner peptoglycan wall is stained pink or red, so it does not retain the purple colored dye. Their peptoglycan wall is sandwiched between the plasma membrane and then a second outer membrane, so it's like in, be, like in between. 
And that outer membrane is uh, got some lipopolysaccharides and it makes it harder to treat, um, treat it with antibiotics. So gram-negative cells are harder to treat in the medical field. So remember with peptoglycan cell walls, it's a very rigid network. It's made up of polysaccharides. It helps the bacteria maintain shape of the cell, protects it from swelling, as well as rupturing in its environment that could also change very rapidly. So. Plasma membrane. All right, can I move on? Yeah. Okay, so these next couple slides are just going to show you what a gram-positive and gram-negative cell wall looks like. So here's the gram-positive where you can definitely see the cell wall and, uh, is the outermost layer of it. This is that peptoglycan cell wall, and it's got lipotoic and um, toic acid um, embedded into it. Gram-negative, the peptoglycan wall is like sandwiched in, and it's thinner. So here's my plasma membrane. Then we have the peptoglycan cell wall, and then on the outside is that lipopolysaccharide. And you can see um, it's got a lot of branches coming out of it, and it, uh, antibiotics have a really hard time piercing the cell wall and affecting the bacteria cells. So these guys tend to be more resistant to antibiotics. The gram stain, which I'm just going to go through. You don't need to uh, write anything down. But what they do is they take a swab or the sample, and they smear it on a microscope, and then they take crystal violet and uh, put it on there. They'll rinse it with water, then they'll add iodine, rinse it again with water, and then they'll add an alcohol, which is a decolorizer. Um, and you'll see that the purple dye kind of washes off some of these cells. So the gram-positive cells will remain purple, and then these guys that are bleached white are colorless. Well, you can't see that in a microscope, so then they have to dye it, uh, dye it with another dye called saffron, um, and then it stains pink. Now, when I was in high school, we actually did a gram stain and gram-negative um, lab. I know I have saffron um, in the chemical cabinet. I'm not sure if I have a crystal violet dye, but yeah. Okay, so you can have a gram-positive um, cell wall, gram-negative cell wall. Uh, one more kind of layer that some bacteria cells have is called an S layer. So it's just an additional protein, or maybe it's a combination of carbs and proteins, so glycoprotein layer. Bless you. And it forms a rigid um, paracrystalline surface. So you can kind of see that there's some um, geometric arrangement associated with it. These can exist in both gram positive and gram negative, and it's usually on the outside of the peptoglycan or the outermost layer, so just kind of on the outside. And they think it aids in adhesion or protection of that bacteria cell. So it's just another layer. So if you zoom in on this, um, you can kind of see the geometric shape associated with it. And you know, there's equilateral triangles, and I don't even know how you would describe um, the rest of the shapes. But they've zoomed in, and there's these structures that kind of protrude out. And they think it might aid in protection or stick into other surfaces. Okay, flagella and pili. So flagella is it's anchored to the cell wall, helps it in movement. Remember, it spins like a propeller. It lacks that n or nine plus two microtubule arrangement. 
On gram-negative cells, um, you might have a pili, which is almost, it almost looks like cilia, hair-like structures, important in adhesion, as well as genetic exchange. And we'll talk about that when we get to transformation, transduction, conjugation, all of that. And the last external structure I'd like to discuss in prokaryotes is something called an endospore. So this picture right here kind of looks like a gobstopper, um, but an endospore is this very, very thick coat or coats, many, many walls that surround the genome, as well as maybe a small portion of the cytoplasm. And it protects um, the bacteria in that genome. Um, I don't want to say it's like hibernation, but when it forms a really, really thick endospore, I mean, it could survive for thousands of years um, and then become activated when conditions are right. So these endospores are highly res resistant to chemicals, um, radiation, dry conditions, temperature extremes, and so if the conditions are not right for that bacteria to thrive, it may form an endospore, and you can kind of see that the many, many layers here around its genome and just wait it out until conditions are right. And then when conditions do improve, then they'll shed those walls and germinate and return back to normal cell division as well as functions. Um, and we've discovered bacteria cells that are centuries year, years old, which is kind of scary, okay? There's this kind of scary movie out there. With, uh, it's called The Thaw. Has anyone heard of it? It's got Val Kil Kilmer in it. It's one of those B movies, just it's not popular. But it, the premise of the story is they come across a woolly mammoth found uh, in the frozen ice. And the woolly mammoth died from a bacteria or some type of pathogen that was like just laying dormant because of this endospore, because of its endospore. So they bring this woolly mammoth back to their lab unknowingly, like they have no idea that it carries this pathogen. And all of a sudden people start going, getting sick and they start to go crazy. And it's just like, it's scary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's... Uh, I, I enjoyed it, but I was like, oh my gosh, it's <laughs> scary. <laughs> okay, so that's the exterior, moving into the interior. Um, we know they don't have organelles, but they do use their plasma membrane um, to carry out important cell functions like cellular respiration and photosynthesis. They don't have a nucleus, but they do have a nucleoid region, which is basically their single double-stranded ring of DNA and they do have ribosomes, but they are a lot smaller than eukaryotes. And this is a good thing um, because antibiotics, what they do is they target prokaryotic ribosomes. Um, so they only recognize prokaryotic ribosomes. They only attack the bacteria cell. If, it, if, we, if they carry the same ribosomes, um, then if, when you take antibiotics, that antibiotics hurts the bacteria as well as your body cells. So it's, it's kind of a nice thing that they have different ribosomes because that could be a, a way to treat it. Okay, so the next couple slides, um, I'm just gonna show you some interesting bacteria um, that have unique internal structures to them. So here we have something called polyhydroxylbutyrate granules, um, and they actually like store like types of gases, like I don't wanna say methane gas, but pretty close to it. Um, these bacteria right here, they store sulfur. So these little dots you see, they're, they're storing sulfur. They're using sulfur as their um, inorganic molecule to get energy. There are some bacteria or prokaryotes that are considered carboxysomes, which means they fix CO2, and because of that, they you know, can float. Um, so we have gas vesicles here um, for buoyancy, and they can adjust it. Uh, so when they're submerged in water, they're kind of like submarines. They can 
oh, there's not a lot of nutrients down at the bottom. Let's move up to the top and see what we can do. Oh, okay, there's some nutrients, and then they can go back down. And I find these guys really fascinating. Magnetosomes. They can actually detect magnets, like the Earth's magnetic field. And they're trying to, you know, why, why would they do that? Um, so one of the current lead-in data is that um, it, it might aid them to remain at a certain depth, kind of like bacteria, like, oh, sorry, not a bacteria, like a submarine. Um, but, yeah, but why use Earth's magnetic field? I mean, I'm not exactly sure. So, anyways, review questions. Which of the following is present only in a gram-positive cell? B, toic acid. Lipopolysaccharides, what kind of cell would you find that in? Gram negative. Okay. The blank contains the genetic information of a prokaryotic cell. A yep, a nucleoid region. Moving on to genetics. So, uh, talk about how DNA can be exchanged in prokaryotes. I don't remember if I'm going to talk on genetic mapping in E. coli. I think I talk about CRISPR. And then talk about um, the spread of antibiotic resistance among prokaryotes. So some terms that you're going to see a lot in this section is conjugation and transformation. So conjugation is a horizontal gene transfer. Okay, Genes from one prokaryotic move to another prokaryotic. And it does require cell-to-cell -cell contact. This is where the pili comes into play. And sometimes when a pili is used in conjugation, they'll call it a sex pili, even though they're not having sex. They're just moving genetic information from one cell to the other. If it's viral, um, they don't tend to call it conjugation. They might call it transduction instead. So this section is all about conjugation, transduction, and transformation. Um, now, transformation occurs when, oh, I have a typo, directly, it's supposed to be directly, um, bacteria will pick up just this random genetic material floating around in the environment because, you know, sometimes bacteria cells die and they rupture and everything just kind of spills out into the environment and another bacteria cell will come along and take that, some of that genetic material in. Um, so if, you, if they get their DNA or parts of DNA from, trans, from their environment, then it's called transformation. So. Okay, so we will discuss conjugation first. So conjugation depends whether or not a prokaryotic cell has something called a conjugate, conjugative uh, plasmid. So plasmids, remember, are accessory, accessory um, DNA fragments. They're circular. They're not the entire genome. They're just like I just said, additional DNA. And plasmids, if they have um, a fertility factor, then they are called F plus cells. If a bacteria cell doesn't have a plasmid with the fertility factor, then we just call them F minus cells. So how that plasma gets transferred from one cell to the other, the F plus cell, so it has the F plasmid, that F plasmid is going to bind to the interior part of the cell that it's in. And then it's going to form this conjugation bridge, also known as like the sex pili. So it's going to form a bridge with another cell or the recipient. And then that F plasmid doesn't just like go through, it actually replicates itself through this process called roll in circle replication. So it kind of just rolls around, spirals that new strand into the recipient cell. And then when it's done, um, they you know close the conjugation bridge and now both cells are considered F plus cells because um, they have a plasmid that can um, be transferred from one cell to the other.
So the next slide, I'm just going to show you a picture of the step, um, just so you can see this roll and replication. So this is the F plus cell because it's got the plasmid. And the only thing I don't like is that it doesn't show the attachment to the interior wall here. But um, it would attach to the interior wall, and then it's going to form that conjugation pelis or sex pelis, that connection bridge. And then it's going to go through roll and replication. So you can see that it kind of like unrolls, and then it starts to replicate um, into the, the host cell or the recipient cell. And then when the process is done, now both cells are F plus cells. Now recombination can also occur between F plasmids in the host chromosome, and it's very similar to crossing over. That's what CO means, crossing over. So that F plasmid in the previous picture, you saw that it wasn't integrated into the host chromosome, um, but just know that it can. Okay, so it can be integrated or it can be excised out of the genome. So cells that have this integrated F plasmid, we call them HFR cells for high frequency of recombination. So if you see an F plus cell um, and it gets integrated into it, like the genome, then it becomes HFR cells, so integrated. If you see an F plus cell um, where it's got its own little plasmid, you know, then we just call it an F plus cell. So it's just more terminology. I don't know if I'll quiz you on this or test you on this. Um, but here's integration, here's my plasmid, there's the genome of the host cell. Um, they'll match up and then splice themselves together. Sometimes the plasma that's been integrated in the, into the host cell genome gets cut out. So it's very similar to like spliceosomes where they um, splice and then, yeah, it's own little entity. Okay, going back to viruses. Viruses can transfer DNA by transduction, and there's two types, generalized versus specialized. Generalized just means that any cell can be transferred a lot of times you see this with lytic phage, so phages that bust out of the host cell after it infects it. But one thing about generalized transduction, you can kind of think, I guess scientists think of it as like an accident with lytic phage because after the viral genome is replicated, the phage head is constructed or made, and then they stuff DNA um, from the bacteria instead of the phage DNA. So it's kind of like a mistake, like, oops, we put the wrong DNA in the head of the, the phage. Specialized transduction is the lysogenic life cycle where it lays dormant. Your book um, says that phages, they like mark specialized transduction with phage lambda, which is that upside down Y. and then um, only a few genes will be transferred in that process. So with the lysogenic state, the phage is called the prophage, and it's dormant, doesn't destroy the cell, but when that cell divides, that prophage also gets copied. Okay, so so far we have talked about transduction where a virus will incorporate the DNA into the recipient cell. We've talked about conjugation 
with plasmids. And so the last thing we have to talk about is transformation, picking up foreign DNA from the environment. So like I said, when a bacteria cell dies, it ruptures, everything just is exposed to the environment. And then a bacteria cell that's nearby just might pick up some of that stuff. So if it takes in that DNA um, and then it starts to incorporate that, that you know, foreign DNA into its own genome, it might start to read some of those genes and it could become deadly or make some other proteins. And so as a result, it's become changed. Uh, so we call this natural transformation, mm -hmm. which means that you know, it becomes changed but during natural conditions. But a lot of times we can simulate this in a lab, so then we call it artificial transformation. If you remember when we were discussing DNA and how it's the information molecule and Avery, no, not Griffith, Griffith with the mice, and he was looking at pneumonia case, oh God, I can't even say it, pneumonia, we'll just say. Um, there's two strands, the deadly form and the non-deadly form, and he like heat killed it, uh, and then he mixed it with the non-deadly form, and all of a sudden the non-deadly form picked up some of those foreign genes from the heat killed and became deadly. So they were transformed, so that's transformation. I think it's Avery Griffith. I think that was his first name. Plasmids can also be responsible for antibiotic resistance. So if they do carry a gene for resistance against antibiotics, we call them R plasmids. Um, so they can, they can pick up R plasmids, but just know that mutations can also occur. Um, where they become antibiotic resistant, so it can occur spontaneously, maybe due to exposure to radiation, UV, as well as other chemicals. But most of the time, antibiotic resistance occurs through transposable elements. So you may remember um, um, McClintock and, and corn, maize, how the different colorations were caused by transposable elements. These are like jump-in genes, okay? So elements can move from one chromosome to the other and back again. So if a bacterium has these genes, it may have a slight advantage in the presence of antibiotics, and we see this a lot with MRSA as well as VRSA. So. Your sister? Which one? Caitlin. Does she? Yeah, they're at um, a thing in the cities for basketball, and they're playing like volleyball on this court, and she like cut up her knee and got MRSA. Mm. And she had it really bad, and like her ear piercing mm -hmm. was so gross. Horse pills, probably. Yeah. Okay, this is a new section uh, in this new edition. Um, CRISPR. So maybe you've heard in the news about the CRISPR gene. Okay, so CRISPR means clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats great name for CRISPR, right? I mean, because who would want to say all that? Um, but CRISPR came about because some prokaryotes in their genome, they have these spacer regions, just like this space that, you know, if they incorporated new DNA, they'd throw it into this space. So that's what, that's what they mean by these space, spacer regions. And it actually turned out to be a defense against viral infection. So if a virus were to infect it, they take the viral genome and put it into this spacer region. And um, what they do is they you know, will read the, the viral um, genome, but they also have like a defense against it. They have this RNA that they produce that degrades this viral nucleic acid. So it's a, these spacer regions were a defense against viral attacks. Now, why we have been interested in it is that CRISPR well, we can like precisely cut genes in any genome and take genes out and swap them for other genes. And so we've been using CRISPR, there's been a lot of research uh, for genome editing. So it's just like a new way to um, splice and take out genes and put in new ones.
All right, review questions. Generalized transduction arises from D. Uh, nope, that's conjugation. Um, nope, that's specialized. It's C, where they accidentally pack the host DNA instead of the phage DNA. So then you get all of the genome and not just parts of it. Horizontal gene transfer of DNA uses using a plasmid is an example of D, D conjugation. All right, moving on to metabolism. Um, so different ways that prokaryotes get energy as well as carbon, and then explain how they can cause disease in humans. So there's four basic ways they can get carbon and energy. The first one's called photoautotroph. So photo means light, autotroph makes their, means they make their own food. Basically, they carry out photosynthesis. There's two ways you can carry out photosynthesis one in the presence of oxygen and one not in the presence of oxygen. So we call it oxygenic. We use light water and then as a waste product you produce oxygen and then your organic molecule, that carb, that carbohydrate. Anoxygenic means you use light and then instead of water you'll use sulfur. Um, and then your byproduct instead of oxygen is some type of hydrogen sulfide or sulfur and then that organic molecule again. Second way they can get carbon and energy is chemolithoautotrophs. So chemo means some type of chemical. Um, actually, I should know what litho means, and I can't think of it. The environment, maybe? But they oxidize inorganic substances. So ammonia, they'll take in ammonia, and they'll oxidize it and make their food. Nitrate, through nitrification, they fix nitrogen, sulfur, and hydrogen gas. Okay, third way, photoheterotrophs. They use light as the source of energy, but they don't make their own carbon. They get that from other organisms. So purple and green non-sulfur bacteria are great examples of photoheterotrophs. And then we also have chemoheterotrophs. They get carbon and energy from organic molecules, and the majority of prokaryotes are classified as chemoheterotrophs. Okay, bacteria can cause disease in humans as well as plants, so they can attack other cells directly. Maybe they'll release proteins that can go through the cell wall, um, through their cell wall, and then infect other cells. They may transfer deadly proteins into eukaryotic cells. A lot of plant pathogens are caused by bacteria. Most of them are considered pseudomonads. So examples of that, blights, soft rots, wilts, So you can see this, back, this maple leaf is being um, infected by some type of bacteria, and if you were to zoom in on that, um, you might see structures like this.
All right, review. A chemolithoautotroph bacterium gets its carbon from blank and its energy from blank. It is C, carbon dioxide and inorganic molecules. Number two, bacteria lack independent internal membrane systems, but are able to perform photosynthesis and respiration, both of which use membranes. They are, are able to perform these functions because mm -hmm. the invaginations of the plasma membrane can provide internal membranes um, functions. All right, the bell's going to ring here, so we will pick up with section five. So we have two more sections. This one's human bacterial disease, and the last one is the uh, the benefits of prokaryotes, how we can use them um, to our benefit. Um, yeah, so I guess I know what we're doing tomorrow. Whoa.